Thank you, as always, for being back so quickly. The hardest challenge of this job is to introduce people who need no introduction. The people we all know or think we know. And yet one of the discoveries of this exact same job, and it's not a job, it's a privilege, but it is also a job, is the discovery that you often know very little about those you engage with or see on a public stage often. We know his biography. We know Shashi Tharoor was the UN Undersecretary General. We know he's been Minister of State for External Affairs for HRD. We know he is the author of 20 books. We know he has won the Sahitya Academy Award, the Commonwealth Writers' Prize. But there's something unique about him, which is to say, while most people in public life often seem to, to project themselves as being much more than they are, he often seems to succeed in doing a little bit less. And I say that because during the course of, of reading a little bit beyond the obvious about Dr. Tharoor's life, there are tiny glimpses of the sheer amount of rigor that have gone into the person he is today. I'll give you a couple of examples. Around the time he was 13, he set himself the challenge of reading 365 books in a year. This is not Amar Chitrakatha. So, this is Russian literature. This is Indian literature in translation. This is the greats of American and English literature. He finished the challenge with a week to spare before Christmas, 365 books in a year. By the age of 22, he won a scholarship to finish. Uh, he went to the US to, to Fletcher School at Tufts to do a master's degree. And in three years, he did a master's, he did an MALD, the Master's in Law and Diplomacy, and a PhD, a, a Fletcher record that, to the best of my knowledge, remains unbroken today. This is scholarship of rigor. This is work that has gone into his public positions. This is knowledge, hard work, erudition that he wears so lightly that we often forget he wears it at all. For that reason, it is a particularly special privilege to say we often understand the personal through the political. I'd like to start by understanding what made the person political. What is the journey that we don't know of this man we think we all know? It's an absolute pleasure to invite up Dr. Shashi Tharoor. Thank you for that lovely introduction. If I could start quite literally by asking, where did this thirst at 13, or maybe even earlier, to know more come from at an age when most of us barely know that we don't know? Do we really know? I mean, uh, where these things come from? I don't know. Choose your parents wisely and the right gene will pop up, you know? Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I, it, it, I, it's just I always had it. I think. One factor was probably the fact that I was a childhood asthmatic. And uh, when you're struggling to breathe, uh, it concentrates the mind wonderfully. Uh, you can't sleep because you can't breathe. Those are the days before inhalers and all these good things that made life a little more bearable for asthmatics. So one would pop some silly um, pill that made your heart beat a thousand times faster than it should uh, in order to get enough air pumped into your lungs uh, or out of it. And, um, and I was up. An awful lot of the time, my, sort of my sleeping troubles began as a childhood asthmatic. Um, and so I think it, it, was, it was partly that. I mean, you know, throughout my childhood, I was um, up reading uh, when I was ill. I was taking exams when I could barely breathe. Uh, so, you know, you really do develop a tremendous, uh, st tremendously strong willpower when you have to overcome a, a physical adversity to do anything that everybody else can take for granted. So you had intended to go into or take the civil services exams. Yeah. And then something happened to change your mind. What happened? The emergency happened. And uh, it was actually, a, a, I've written about this in my book, India from Midnight to the Millennium, so I'm not saying anything new. But, you know, I was obviously very much a child of the establishment. I actually met Indira Gandhi when I was president of St. Stephen's College Students' Union and she was prime minister. And, um, and, and, and I must say, when I first went abroad, I mean, it was not nearly as full of Indians, <laughs> the US, uh, as it is now. So I was still uh, 
bearing some of those old fashioned, I, I went abroad in 75, so we're really are talking ancient history here, 45 years ago. Um, uh, one, one really had the obligation, as it were, to speak for one's country. And it was by defending India, the government, and everything else, that I began to realize uh, how awful was what had happened to my country. I had a roommate at Fletcher. Most of the other Fletcher students are mid-career. So this guy was a journalist, and he was working when he wasn't studying. And he would come back with reams of telex copy uh, of the stuff that the American papers weren't printing because they didn't have that much interest in India. So I was getting a lot more info about everything, you know, Turkman Gate and the vasectomies and the abolition, all, all, all the horrors that were going on at that time. And also, I still remember one particular moment of epiphany. There was an Indian student at the University of Chicago who was an outspoken critic of the emergency. And uh, he needed a routine passport renewal. And the embassy refused to renew his passport and impounded his passport and said, you go back home to India, we want to jail you. And I thought, my God, this is what my country has come down to? And, and I, I just said, there's no way that I can write the civil service exams to serve a government that's capable of doing this to its own people. And at that point, I essentially ended up uh, deciding to do a PhD, but my scholarship was likely to run out, which is why I, I not only broke that record that you mentioned, it can't be broken again, because the academic device that I use, a particular petition route, has since been abolished. But, <laughs> but, uh, but I, 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 I petitioned, I had straight A's and all that stuff, so there was a reason why they granted me the right to abbreviate the preparation time required to take my PhD orals and then write the thesis. But I did write a 650-page thesis in, in nine months, so I, I, I did have you know, an, early, an early desire to sort of finish my work before the funds ran out. I'd, I, I'd like to come to why you chose the UN, but just to stay with that for a minute, what did leaving the country, in fact, so much of the criticism we hear today about Indians outside the country and their right to speak about this country or their right to claim the feel for this country rests on the belief that when you're distant, you don't care. Did leaving, in fact, crystallize for you what mattered about the country? Yeah, you know, actually, in my case, it's an even more complicated story because I was born in London. And my parents chose to come back when I was about two, two and a half years old. So I'd grown up entirely in India. Uh, but when I was first, for example, uh, going to the US on the scholarship and stopping in London on the way, uh, I, could <laughs> I discovered to my astonishment that I actually um, was eligible for a British passport. And I found out by applying for a visa and finding myself being summoned from the waiting room to the deputy high commissioner's office in Calcutta. And I wondered what I'd done wrong to merit this. And the fellow says, you know, you do realize that we can give you a passport, you can't get a visa. And I said, well, no, and I don't want a passport, I'm Indian. The guy said, yeah, but you can have one anyway, as far as we're concerned, it is, it's possible. But he said, I have another problem, which is I'm not allowed to give you a visa. Because I cannot give you a visa when you have a legal right to it. So I said, what do I do then? I want to go and stop in London. He says, no problem, just show them your normal Indian passport, showing you were born in London, they let you in. And it did work, until Mrs. Thatcher came to power and made things a bit tougher for brown-skinned people. That actually was what I did for about four years. But anyway, that's a distraction. Just to say that I had made a conscious choice at a fairly young age that I knew what I was and what I, you know, where I felt my loyalties lay. Uh, and so, uh, I, mean, I, I, I sometimes tend to say slightly naively, I look in the mirror and I see an Indian. But in my case, it, it's a process that came out of a, an interrogation that I had to do very young. Um, uh, and, and because as a child, I had said, no, this is what I care about, the country I care about, and what I want to uh, uh, understand more about, my ambition had been to do something like the IFS or the IAS, and because I was inconveniently good at taking exams and kept topping all the exams that I was taking, I knew that since that was the way to get in, I had a pretty decent chance of getting in. Um, but in the end, anyway, as I said, I, I said no to that particular career option. Did a PhD instead. And the UN seemed very much a second best alternative. Because, you know, frankly, um, the foreign service in those days was the glamour service. You had to be in the top eight or ten of the UPSC examinations or get into the foreign service. Um, the IAS 
were only full of people who hadn't made it to the foreign service. You know, it's very much, very much the opposite of what the situation is today, uh, when the IAS is top dog and even customs and revenue attract more people than the foreign service today, sadly. But anyway, um, well, for very disreputable reasons for the most part, I might add. Uh, but uh, we'll, we'll go into that off the record at some point when there's no mic involved. Uh, but in any case, I, I, um, I then got into, um, uh, uh, into, into this PhD thing, and, and um, uh, I had met a wonderful Indian official at the United Nations, a man called Virendra Dayal, not because of any interest in the UN or, the, or, or anything else I was doing, but because he was on holiday in Calcutta and read an article of mine in the newspaper, and expressed to his host um, an interest um, or a regard for the chap who'd written this article. And his host said, oh, really? You want to meet this guy? And the guy said, sure. And the fellow said, well, he's coming home for a cast party in the play we are both acting in. I was the hero come villain in Agatha Christie's Mousetrap, I think it was. Nothing has changed. <laughs> there you are. Yes, I am still a hero come villain, but we'll come to that part later. Uh, anyway, so I, I, I met him, and, and he said to me, why did you apply for the UN? And, uh, you know, obviously being an Indian was not an asset. It still isn't today, and it wasn't then, because Indians have very quickly become overrepresented at the main UN. But there were these uh, agencies that didn't have national quotas. And UN, uh, the UN High Commissioner for Refugees was the one that he knew, so he introduced me um, to them. And he was very, very proper and correct, refused to participate in the interview. But they called me to New York for an interview. I had three people interviewing me, and they seemed to be suitably impressed, and they called me to Geneva for an interview, and by the time they'd done that, they'd spent so much money on me, they had to hire me. So. <laughs> you know, one of the things that, uh, when we say the UN, I think it's often not visible, just what goes into, and, and by the time you were 25, you were in Singapore, and if I'm not correct, I mean, if I'm not wrong, I hope I am correct, uh, you oversaw the Vietnamese boat people crisis. Well, I, I, I oversaw the Singapore office of the UN High Commissioner yeah. for Refugees, which was dealing principally with the Vietnamese uh, boat people being rescued at sea by ships sailing the South China Sea and being brought into the port. Now, what happens is that these ships, when they bring refugees into port, somebody has to get them off the ship, and the host country has to be willing to accept them. In the case of Singapore, they were quite unhappy at the idea of all these Vietnamese invading their shores. They made this the UN's responsibility. So the UN actually uh, ran a refugee camp in Singapore, which is something you can hardly believe today, a refugee camp in Singapore. I'm talking the early 80s. And, um, and, uh, and I was responsible for all the aspects of it. That is negotiating with the countries from which the ships came, negotiating with the Singaporeans, negotiating with the embassies of the potential receiving countries, because if I couldn't get these refugees moving out to third countries for resettlement, Singapore would shut the door on them. So if I wanted to be able to disembark more refugees, I had to get out the ones who were already there. And that had been a bit difficult for my predecessor before I got there, because we had about 4,000 people uh, accommodated in about 25 houses in this camp. So you can imagine the numbers, it was so heavy that there were some people physically living on trees, literally on the branches of trees, there no other place to sit, it was that bad. And, and so I had to really uh, come up with a few creative original ideas and it went well and I was able to, to break the back of that particular problem. And in the meantime, I became a bit of an expert on rescue at sea, which was quite a fascinating area. And I also became, um, I suppose in many ways, uh, the humanist I am today because I saw uh, a tremendous amount of human drama um, at, at very elemental levels. I mean, I can tell you story after story, and I won't waste everyone's time with all of them, including of people who, who ended up, frankly, um, running out of anything to sustain life, uh, food, fuel, and water, and in one case, actually decided to kill the most vulnerable amongst themselves and eat him uh, in order to just survive. That's how desperate some of these people can get. Um, and that is a different story, which I won't, I won't uh, go into all the details of, but one story with a little more hopeful that, that, that still sticks in my mind was of a young couple who left in a tiny boat with a cannibalized tractor engine. Um, and they set out for the South China Sea, but of course, the tractor engine conked out before too long, and the boat started drifting aimlessly on the high seas. They ran out of food, they ran out of drinking water, and essentially, they were surviving on rainwater and hope. But because 
they had two small infants with them, a tiny baby a few weeks old and a child about a year and a half or two. They, the children weren't going to survive on rainwater. So the parents slit their fingers and made the infants suck their blood in order to get enough nourishment in order to survive. And when they were rescued, as it happens, by an American ship, they were so weak they couldn't even stand up in the boat. And my staff and I broke every rule in the book and rushed them to intensive care as soon as they got to Singapore. And then to see that same family a few months later, healthy and well-fed and well-dressed and ready to set off for new lives in the U.S., that gave me a tremendous amount of faith in the possibility of solutions to seemingly intractable problems. And uh, in many ways, it helped make me the, the optimist I am, that I, I do believe that there's nothing that we can't overcome. Maybe, you know, yesterday's, uh, may maybe today's problems are not going to all immediately be solved, um, but, but we can be sure that yesterday's problems are not today's problems. And therefore, today's problems need not remain problems tomorrow. And that gives me the will to go on. Um, I think about 11 and a half years after you started at the UN, you moved from rescue to peacekeeping. Yeah. And uh, you were, during the Balkans crisis and Bosnia and so on, you were very much at the heart of uh, what was going on. Will you tell us a little bit of what it is to be in the thick of some of the most intransigent, you know, political crises on the global on the global stage. Yeah, I mean, I, I must say that, you know, it was a, a great privilege to be able to leave one smudgy thumbprints on the footnotes of the pages of history, because when I look back on my UN life, I really was a part of some of the more important human events uh, of my time. The, the boat people crisis was one of them, and certainly uh, the Yugoslav civil war, looking back on the history of the last five decades or so, will loom in many people's consciousness as a hugely important time. Uh, and I was there from the very early days. Initially, the UN was understandably quite reluctant to get involved because our approach historically had been that for peacekeeping to work, you need a peace to keep. That is that the parties have to agree on a peace, but they don't trust each other, so you need a neutral third party, the United Nations, to come in and maintain the peace. That was the logic of peacekeeping. But in the case of the former Yugoslavia, we were dragged into it while the war was going on. I've had a a few harrowing experiences visiting uh, at the beginning of the war in late 1991. I was tasked to actually go through the front lines and see what the conditions were that were going on in the fighting. Uh, at that point, it was just a Serb-Croat war. They had started off with a Serb-Slovene war, and the Slovenes had won, and they had become independent de facto, though not yet recognized. Then the Croats rebelled, and the Croats uh, were at war with the official Yugoslav National Army, which was essentially Serbian. Bosnia was still neutral. So I remember me and a Finnish colonel with a Bosnian uh, driver driving through the Serb front lines, then to the Croat front lines, talking to the, um, to the soldiers on both sides, and then going over again to the Serb front lines in Croatia, because there was a whole area that was Serb majority. It, it was quite extraordinary. And one of the things I should tell you about that experience during that very trip that I'll never forget is I remember going to a Croat military headquarters, um, and in the course of the, the commanders speaking to me, uh, the fellow pulled out a photograph of uh, literally a row of seven dead babies, their throats slit, bullet wounds in their foreheads, horrible babies, okay? And he said, look at these horrible Serbs, what they've done to our children. And I took it all in and so on. And then I went on through the front lines to Knin in the Serbian part of Croatia, and met the famous, later notorious, Ratko Mladic, the, the Serbian general fighting there. And uh, he gave us a harangue as well about all the horrible things that the Croats are doing. And then he produced the same photograph, the identical photograph, and said, look what these horrible Croats are doing to our children. And you know, it's something that truly you'll never forget, because it, first of all, was a reminder that these were essentially the same people. They're all descendants of Balkans, of, of, uh, of, of, of Slavic settlers in the Balkans, going back to about the 7th century uh, AD. That the, it was only history that separated them. So the Serbs were Orthodox and largely part of the Ottoman Empire. The Croats were largely Catholic and largely part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. The Serbian and Croatian languages were so similar even more similar than Hindi and Urdu, barely a 5% vocabulary difference, that till that date, they were actually known as Serbo-Croatian. Do you speak Serbo-Croatian? There was no sense that they were separate languages. Um, 
Of course, Croatian was written in the Roman script, Austro-Hungarian Empire. Serbian was written in the Cyrillic script, you know, because there's Orthodox Eastern country. But, but what was fascinating was here are the same people, impossible to tell apart, often with the same surnames, and here they were butchering each other. And then, of course, Bosnia also um, collapsed in, into warfare. I remember a man telling me with anguish I can never forget again about um, my neighbor with, who, with whom I left my key raped my daughter. When I would go off on summer holidays, I would leave my key with him. And, and you know, there's a level of human horror that you can't believe until, of course, you see what happened in Delhi in the last three or four days, and you realize, yes, it can even happen here. And that's pretty horrible, too. So this is what, what, what I saw. I also, of course, nearly stepped on minefields. I've had shells flying over my head. I've been in underground bunkers while, while artillery has been going in both directions. I've seen a lot. But, but the main and most significant thing I think I learned was about human beings. And um, both about all of us, as, as uh, the, the depths to which we can sink, how thin in many ways is the veneer of civilization. Um, uh, and, and how quickly demagogic politicians, populists, purveyors of hatred can peel off or scratch off that level of civilization to expose the raw prejudice, bigotry, hatred, violence that seeds underneath. I think a lot of human life and politics and civilization ought to be about keeping that skin intact and not allowing it to be exposed in all its raw horror, as I have seen too, too, too much close up. I wanted to come to a strand that is virtually run parallel in your life along with this career is writing. And um, when did you start to write? What was the trigger or what were the concerns out of which that writing began? Well, as I mentioned, I was an asthmatic kid, so I was in bed all the time. Television didn't exist in India in those days. I don't think anybody has made asthma look as desirable as you're doing this evening. <laughs> anyway, there was no television in India in any case. There was no you know, personal computing hadn't been a gleam in an inventor's eye. The mobile phone didn't exist to distract you. There was no Nintendo or PlayStation. All I had were books, and um, I read inconveniently fast. I would finish any library book my parents borrowed for me in the car on the way home from the library, pretty much. So... The Bombay traffic being what it was, I was growing up in Bombay. So books uh, were my escape, they were my entertainment, they were my education. I read everything I could lay my hands on. I didn't have any elder brothers or sisters, so it was only my parents' books. So I read way above my age level from a very young age, because all I had were my parents' books to dip into. Uh, and, and, and uh, you know, you can imagine this little scrawny uh, child gasping for air, big eyes, devouring page after page. That explains a lot about me, I guess, today. Uh, but that was, that, was, that was who I was. And then when you really ran out of stuff to do, there were only two things you could do with books. One is you could read them, and the second is you could play book cricket. I don't know anybody here is of a vintage to have played book cricket. But uh, book cricket is when you take a fat volume and you turn the pages at random. And, you know, my, my rule and various in place, the left-hand side page, the last digit was the run scored in that particular over or that particular delivery, whichever. And then if you got to a zero, that was a how's that? And then you open the right-hand side page, and if it was a, uh, a different, each number corresponded to LBW court, whatever, and one was not out. So that's how the, you made up imaginary teams and played entire matches uh, with them. Uh, but once you f finished that too, and you got tired of both, what was left to you? All I could think of was to write. And I started writing around age six or so, stories that were very derivative, very imitative of what I was reading. And I was reading all the Enid Blyton short stories. So she had her famous five and her secret seven. So I had my six solvers, who were Indian kids going off and having adventures like her, her kids in these stories. Uh, and my father, bless his soul, was absolutely um, encouraging. He would get the stories typed up by secretary so they could be passed around to friends. And, and I began to believe in the possibility so what I was writing could be of interest to more than just myself. And then I, you know, I don't know, again, I'm sure no one in this room anymore anyway reads or has heard of or has read the Biggles books. Biggles, okay, all right, good. I'm in kindred company. 
So I wrote about an Anglo-Indian fighter pilot called Reginald Bellows, and I wrote what I fancied was a novel, Operation Bellows. Um, it was serialized in six installments in the Junior Statesman magazine, uh, starting a week before my 11th birthday. I had actually appeared in print, print already once with a short story that came out in the Sunday edition uh, of the Free Press Journal in Bombay. The Sunday edition, for some reason, had a different name. It was called the Bharat Jyoti. So I had a story there. That was my first appearance in print, and then the serialized sort of novel in... Um, I, I wrote it in deadly earnest, but the editor wrote saying this will remind people of Baron Munchausen, which wasn't actually a great compliment because he implied that all the feats that my heroes were getting up to were so improbable. They were like tall tales, but anyway. So when, you when also you had a book banned it, during the emergency. Oh, well, that's another story. But before I get the emergency, let me just say that, that because I had appeared in print at that young age, it really became an addiction. You see your name in print for the first time, um, and it's really like the first bite of chocolate or the first kiss or whatever. I mean, you really want to keep repeating it. And so the result was that I ended up writing throughout my school days. I would come, ha come home, finish my homework, and churn out a short story or an article or something. Then the magazine started commissioning me to do pieces, usually sort of campus journalism, but also other things. And I can say that by 1975, when I went off to the U.S., I had appeared in every single English language magazine in India, including Eve's Weekly and Femina. <laughs> so at that point, uh, I went off, and, and for my pains, I won something, which in those days was quite a prestigious award called the Rajika Kripalani Young Journalist Award, uh, uh, which my father collected very proudly on my behalf because I was already in the States. But, um, but then there was a proliferation after the, in the post-emergency period, Suddenly, with the freedom that dawned, so did sort of freedom to make multiple publications, and so we had too many magazines for anyone to be able to make that boast again. But pre-1975, I did appear. Now, one of my stories being banned in the emergency, yeah, that was quite funny. I wrote a short story called The Political Murder. And uh, it was, again, you know, honestly, my stories are, uh, are largely juvenilia, but if anyone is interested, they were collected by my good friend David Davidar, 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 who is lurking somewhere in this audience. I've been calling him David Davidar all my life, and suddenly he tells me last week it's actually Davidar. Uh, he was at uh, Penguin, and he published them in a collection called The Five Dollar Smile and Other Stories. So anyway, the story called The Political Murder, I won't give away the twist in the tale, in, in case you want to buy The Five Dollar Smile, but, but uh, you can imagine, it happened to be scheduled by the JS magazine, as the junior statesman had become, the very week that the emergency was declared. And when the emergency was declared, for the first few months, the government actually sent censors into the, um, into the um, uh, newspaper offices. And so the censor saw the story, just the very title, I'm not even sure he read the story. He saw the title, The Political Murder, and said, banned, remove, you know, forbidden for publication. So I had the distinction of having been banned during the emergency, but uh, I'm sure there are many who wish they could still ban me today. Uh, fortunately, we haven't come back to that stage yet. In many ways, your writing, uh, while it seems to, to work with contemporary concerns, always goes back to beginnings, mm -hmm. uh, seeks to go back to beginnings. Why do you think beginnings matter? Why is it necessary to go back and examine the past? Well, as I said when I wrote my book, An Era of Darkness, about British colonialism in India, and I said this particularly to young audiences, if you don't know where you've come from, how will you appreciate where you're going? I mean, you know, all of us as individuals are curious about our parents, our grandparents, at least some even go back further, find out what made them, you know, what their history, their stories were, how we got up. I mean, I'm one of those guys who did send off my DNA sample to find out what my genetic ancestry was. I mean, these are, I don't know, maybe my curiosity is morbid, but I don't think so. I think most of us have that level of curiosity. Why should we not, as a society, have the same level of curiosity about our past? We should know what came, you know, how did we come to be the India we are today? Um, and, and surely a, a broader appreciation of the vastness of our past is bound to be of far greater significance um, to our understanding of today and to how we conduct ourselves today. If we don't have that appreciation, it strikes me as something that 
that, that we, we deprive ourselves of an understanding of what the country is all about. You've said that history is neither for excuses nor for revenge. Mm. What is history for? Well, I said history is certainly not for excuses or for revenge because history is its own revenge. You know, as time evolves and new developments occur, there can be no doubt that ultimately the things that you want to feel vengeful for will in effect have turned around. I mean, you know, if, you, if, if your resentment about the um, Muslim invasions of a thousand years ago is so great that you want to hurt Muslims today, you're being pathetic because the poor Muslim of today is not the same chap who was your uh, overlord a thousand years ago, if at all there was that. And in any case, he's not accountable for his past any more than you're accountable for your ancestors' past. You know, you really have to go on and live, live your own lives. And, and Anyway, but we're going on, on a tangent. But what history does, it seems to me, teach us is about the extraordinary complexity of what we are. I mean, India as a country, and it was interesting, very interesting to listen to T.M. Krishna, because when he was talking about the, um, the, the Mridanga maker, makers and, and their history, he was also delving into the past. I mean, they are doing what they are doing today because, if you like, of centuries of practice, habit, custom. And he is the first one who started to question it. But if he wasn't aware of all of that, his questions today would make no sense. And certainly they could not be answered without an appreciation of what led up to this moment. Um, and that, I think, is something which, which all of us uh, surely will appreciate, both whether we look at our own lives or whether we look at, uh, at the past of our, of our place. I mean, um, our country has, has had a wonderfully rich history. And there's a lot we can learn from it. Um, there's also, I mean, one of the things I've learned about history, one of the lessons you learn from history is that history can teach you the wrong lessons. And if you've half digested history, as some of our leaders have, uh, then it will teach you the wrong lessons and you will try and apply the wrong lessons to the present. And we're seeing some of that today. Why a career in politics? I think sometimes we forget that your, your formal political career started maybe just a dozen years ago. Right. Why, That's right. Why did you, sorry, why did you feel that there was something to be done, particularly in politics? Why could diplomacy not do it? Why could you not do it through your writing? Well, as you know, I lost an election. I mean, I, I, I ran for Secretary General of the UN, and uh, uh, as Groucho Marx would say, it was close but no cigar, right? I, I, I fell short by two votes. One of those was the U.S. veto. And it was also said, I think, by John Bolton that uh, you lost because the U.S. did not want a strong Secretary General. Yeah, he was amazingly disloyal to his own government and his own instructions to put that in black and white in his memoir, or at least in the first edition of his memoir. People tell me he's taken it out of subsequent editions. But with that kind of marching orders, um, it was all right. My goose was cooked. But I felt that I couldn't stay on. I mean, Ban Ki-moon did know me, and he was gracious enough to invite me to remain. But I felt that it would be invidious. I mean, if I were to stay on having challenged him for the job, anything I said or didn't say would be used and misused and twisted in one way or the other. So I, I decided to move on. Uh, initially, in fact, I spent about uh, almost two years um, uh, in, in a very different sort of uh, avatar uh, based out of New York uh, uh, where I was helping run a, uh, an operation for... Um, an Indian company based in Dubai that was exploring investments in India. And I sort of would travel to India and meet people and see it. Particularly Kerala was the focus. Um, but in the process of all of that, A, I realized that I had no great appetite for business. The bottom line didn't move me enough. And I'm sorry for all the business people in the audience. Uh, you know, everyone has their own passions and, and that just wasn't mine. Um, but India did. And sort of talking to a state government official about the condition that would be required to be able to start a major project and so on was enough to get you a sense of some of the challenges going on. But frankly, uh, you know, I had never contemplated a political career, even though I knew that in a democracy, the most significant way you can make a difference is through politics, but I hadn't because I I assumed that someone like me who came from a very middle-class professional background, had no political pedigree, no politicians up the family tree, that I would never get a, a, a look in through the door, so I never even tried. Um, somewhat to my surprise, 
I found myself being approached by all three major political formations um, within a short while of, 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 of uh, pulling out of the UN race. And, um, and to my mind, you know, obviously the Congress had evolved a great deal since the days of the emergency. And uh, having closely followed developments in India and written about them from the outside, um, it was the party that came closest to my own convictions. I mean, the one thing about me that no one can easily accuse me of is political inconsistency, because I have the longest paper trail imaginable. My first book was published 39 years ago now, and I've had you know, 20 books to lay out a vision of the world, which is instinctively uh, liberal. Um, I know that people in this country are excessively fond of the word secular. Strictly speaking, I'm not secular because I happen to be a believer, and secularism is about distancing from religion. Uh, I had preferred in my books to talk about pluralism, but I had been a strong voice for Indian pluralism, uh, for diversity, for the acceptance of difference as being hallmarks of my culture, of my civilization. And, uh, and at the same time, when it came to economics, I was a bit right uh, of where Nehruji was in terms of I was not particularly fond of, of state-controlled uh, socialism. But I was also passionately wedded to social justice. And uh, I applauded the liberalization, uh, which freed up the economy and transformed it in so many wonderful ways. But I also applauded the fact that the Congress Party believed that the fruits, the revenues coming to the government because of liberalization that had grown up because the economy was so much larger, that it should be distributed to those who didn't have any or were marginalized or oppressed who were on the sidelines. And that emphasis on social justice appealed to me as well, whereas the BJP that I was dealing with when I was an undersecretary in the UN, and of course, as the senior Indian of the UN, I was introduced every year to the visiting prime minister, so I met Vajpayee Saab and, and Manmohan Singh, of course, I had known earlier from his days in Geneva, uh, which coincided with mine. Uh, but I'd seen a succession of prime ministers and foreign ministers, and I knew that as far as, um, as far as, uh, the BJP was concerned, not only did they have the baggage of Hindutva, which I was intellectually uncomfortable with, but also had done great damage to the society with the Ram Janmabhoomi movement, and their economics were about India shining, which was proclaimed without really asking who India was shining for. So all of these things made up my mind that if at all I was to support a particular party in Indian politics, it would have to be the Congress. And as it happened, I was asked, would you like to contest? So I said, why not? I mean, which in many ways seems a ridiculously reckless and foolhardy decision because I had no idea what it would take to contest a Lok Sabha election. And believe me, it was the toughest thing I've ever done my first election. Um, there I was, you know, uh, <laughs> on the, the hottest month of the year in Kerala, which is April, uh, the hottest times of the day, with an impossible campaigning schedule drawn up for me by the very people who most resented by getting the ticket because they had hoped for it themselves. So I was put through an absolute grinder. There were days when I would literally campaign for 23 hours. Uh, you know, at 10 o'clock, you switch off the mics because of the election commission rules, and then they made you campaign without it. And then you shut your eyes for one hour and get up again and go on. It was absolute murder. But it, in the end, it worked. I won a record majority, and uh, here I am back the third time. But as I've told the voters, and I'll repeat here because I mean it, I'll only stay in politics as long as I genuinely believe I can make a difference. A difference to my voters and my constituents, and a difference to the country, to the political discourse in the nation. And the day I feel that I've ceased to have that impact, I'm very happy to move on. Uh, I don't see myself as a political careerist. I haven't been one. I don't need to start being one. I don't really, at this point in my life, um, I see politics as a platform for the ideas, principles, and convictions that I hold. I do not see it as a job. I don't see it as something where I have to climb up a greasy pole. I don't care what titles uh, may await or may not come my way. Uh, all I want is to be able to try and steer the ship of state in the right direction to the extent that I can, whether from the opposition or in the country. Um. We'll take 10 minutes more before we open it up to the audience. And I, I'll come to contemporary India, maybe not the particular present political moment, because I think a lot of the audience questions will be about that, but at a more conceptual level. Before that, and because 
the TM is here because we were speaking of caste. Your con the Oxford Union, the very famous Oxford Union speech, and then the book, you made a case for reparations um, from the British. And you also referenced the struggle and maybe a, a section of the political will in uh, the US about reparations for the black community. And I wanted to ask whether there is a case, how you would respond to the idea of reparations for the Dalit community in India. Does India owe its Dalits reparations? Okay, well, that's a different question from the first one. Let me just stress, I didn't actually, um, I, I don't consider myself to be an advocate for reparations per se, because as I said in the Oxford debate, see, I'm stuck with the topic the Oxford Union has chosen, and their topic was that Britain owes reparations to its former colonies. Um, I actually said in my speech, reparations are very difficult to conceive because how do you quantify, how do you put a value on something like the 35 million Indian lives lost to totally unnecessary famines generated and sustained by British colonial policy? Um, how, how, do you, how do you put a monetary value on that and say pay us reparations? I said also if you look at the systematic drain of Indian resources going back to the 1700s, you're going to get to such an astronomical amount that any credible amount would not be payable and any payable amount would not be credible. So I said, rather than reparations, you give a symbolic one pound a year for the next 200 years because each of that one pound transfers would be a sorry for the previous 200. That obviously would be unimplementable to any finance ministry, so I'm afraid it's not going to work. But I'm not, I actually don't believe in reparations per se for, for the reason I gave you. At the same time, I had argued that the British owe us atonement. And atonement, I suggested to them, can take three forms. Number one is admitting the facts of their colonial reality in their school system. Right now, you can do A-levels in history in Britain without ever actually studying a line of colonial history. Just as you can read Jane Austen without knowing that the lifestyle she describes actually sustained by the the, the sweat on the brows of black slaves in Jamaica on the sugar plantation. So you can celebrate the liberalism of Gladstone without knowing that Gladstone's family was one of those compensated in cash for the abolition of slavery. The slaves were never compensated. But those who lost slaves because slavery was abolished, they were given cash by the British, and Gladstone's family made a fortune out of that, uh, and so on and so forth. Just not knowing about these things... Uh, I've quoted in my book, you know, Walpole, the writer, taking a horse carriage down a, a main street in London and counting the number of mansions built with Indian money, money stolen from India. So given all of that, you know, let's not talk about reparations, quite frankly, let's talk about atonement. So I said, first of all, teach the truth, bring it into your school curriculums, let children know. And the price of their not knowing, by the way, is that when I wrote my book, there was a poll by the British, very respected polling organization, YouGov, which found that 59% of young people in Britain actually thought the empire was a great thing and they'd love to have it back. 59%. And I believe the numbers have gone up since my book was published. So, I mean, there's this incredible level of ignorance because all the British know about colonialism is these gauzy, romanticized soap operas on television. Anyway, that's one thing. The second form of atonement, I said, you've got a capital city full of museums. Set up a museum to colonialism. You know, you've got, I mean, every single one of your museums in London is a chor bazaar. It's full of looted and purloined artifacts from my country and other people's country. So instead of saying, come and pay me 20 pounds to see what my grandfather stole from your grandfather, why don't you actually just set up a museum that actually depicts the reality of this? So just as the, 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 the poor Germans are busing school children to the Nazi concentration camps to teach them never again, let British school children have a place they can go to and see what their ancestors did to help build up their prosperity at the expense of this nation. And the third thing, of course, I said was a simple sorry, which, of course, we still haven't got. Apologies always stick in the throats uh, of the country. So when it comes to the Dalits, atonement is the way forward uh, because uh, there is no meaningful way in which you can pay reparations to 15% of the Indian population. The affirmative action that Ambedkar Sahab wrote into the, into the Constitution, I strongly support, and I believe that the reservations in educational institutions, in government jobs, even in Parliament, are a way of ensuring a guarantee of outcome and not just a guarantee of opportunity. 
because what uh, affirmative action in the Western world means is only opportunity. But if you haven't given them the same conditions, then opportunity becomes another form of inequity. Uh, how else can you atone? I think certainly recognition and respect, which is often, often lacking. But very often I would say that development has been playing a constructive role. I mean, I would love to know what, what TM Krishna thinks about this because he's engaged with this very TM directly. Krishna. But uh, uh, one of the things that struck me about Dalits in many walks of life is there is no uniform one-size-fits-all answer. Right? There are Dalit uh, civil servants or politicians in positions of great power who exercise a lot of power over, over uh, quote-unquote upper castes. And there are Dalits who to this day live in conditions of humiliation and, and abnegation. So uh, the truth is it varies. One has to find multiple solutions to a problem that has multiple aspects. One last thing to say, because I, I heard him say something similar, but I learned it the hard way, is that there are some of us who've grown up priding ourselves on being indifferent to caste. Um, uh, certainly that was the way I was brought up. Uh, I've written about this in my books, and at least two of my books, in the sense that my father dropped his caste name in college because Mahatma Gandhi was against it. I have a name that indicates nothing about my, my caste background. Um, I married too often for my own good, but women outside my caste. Uh, and, and I have never once either known or sought to know the caste of anybody I've hired on my staff, in my constituency, or in Delhi, or at home. If tomorrow it turns out my cook is a Dalit, I wouldn't care a damn because he's a damn good cook. And that's essentially my, been my attitude to caste. But I wrote this once, and I got a stinging rebuke from an 18-year-old Dalit blogger who said, don't you realize that obliviousness to caste is itself the affectation of the So that was my privileged. question, is the privilege... And I really, I, I've, I've written about her, I mean, it really made me think anew, because the honest truth is, I thought I was being which I was horrified when that, what was that case last year when the IAS officer fired her cook for having not revealed to her that she was a Dalit. Oh my God, how backward this is. But the fact that I didn't care and didn't ask was not a virtue. That was something that I found hard to understand and accept. But I did when it was flung at me quite directly. And that many of us, I'm sure, in this room will have to face up to that sort of, that sort of thing too in our lives, in our work or at our homes. Um, we'll open this up, but, but a final question. And, and possibly a, it's a big question about the state of India at this moment. And you wrote earlier this year, you pinpointed eight factors. I know we probably can't go into all of them, but a few of which were, uh, were interesting for why India is at this place where all our possibility seems to be stalled. And I think one of the things you, for example, you said it's the social consequences of a deepening democracy, which is an interesting way to put it. Why is the social consequence of a deepening democracy the seeming absence of democracy? Well, it wasn't meant to be. I mean, I, I, you know, I, I, that piece, if I remember right, had eight different factors it does. In, in it. And one of the things that happened with, <coughs> excuse me, with um, the fact that our democracy worked and, and spread itself was that a lot of people acquired significant amounts of power without necessarily uh, the education or the intellectual uh, trappings that historically had been associated with those who would aspire to power which meant that a lot of the prejudices, a lot of the bigotries, a lot of the, uh, a lot of the issues, very frankly, I mean, I, I, I can tell you, Dr. Ambedkar, for example, one of his disagreements with Gandhiji was that he said, listen, Gandhiji is exalting the villages, but don't you realize these villages are absolute sinks of caste prejudice and iniquity and, 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 and horror? Uh, and it's a similar thing, you know, you, we exalt democracy, but people have come up into power who have no sense that they can say the things they're saying. Uh, and, and to be very blunt, when I was growing up in India, in, in the Bombay of the 1960s, no one would have actually been able to utter such thoughts even in the privacy of their living room behind closed doors, and we're now hearing them from public political platforms by people serving on the Council of Ministers of the Government of India. And, uh, you know, such people with that kind of thinking and that kind of vocabulary and the willingness to express it wouldn't have come anywhere near power. 
in the earlier days. But now they're in power, and we have to reckon with that. So it is, it is, I know I'll be accused of condescending elitism, and I don't mean that, I mean it as a sociological observation. There are people in power who, who don't have that sort of entire uh, acculturation through education and through a larger worldview to understand that this kind of prejudice is simply not cool. We'll open this up to questions. Uh, as hands go up and mics go around, one final question. At the end of 2019, after seeing Shashi Tharoor, the diplomat, the politician, the author, um, we saw Shashi Tharoor, well, also Shashi Tharoor, the one-man thesaurus, but we saw Shashi Tharoor, the stand-up comic. <laughs> Clearly, many of us in this room saw the stand-up comic. Yeah, I'm afraid I've been giving you too much of Shashi Tharoor, the sit-down tragic today. <laughs> so my apologies. Uh, but, uh, but, but, but there is, unfortunately, a lot, lot to be tragic about. I did tell T.M. Krishna a story, though, about his wonderful story about, um, about uh, when you asked him to sing. And he talked about the Balaburi Krishna Singh call a surgeon to perform a surgery. A doctor friend of mine actually told me that whenever people come up to him to, at a party and trouble him for medical advice. He smiles and says, very good, please undress. <laughs> and that, and that usually, usually ends the harassment. So that'll be my one contribution, sit down comedy this evening. But I uh, just wanted to ask, what, uh, and, and that's, uh, politicians are not known for turning their gaze on themselves. Was it difficult? Was it easy? What did you enjoy about it was that diff process? It was difficult. Oh, what I enjoyed was that it worked. It might not have worked. Uh, but you know, the thing is, um, when you make a speech, okay, a joke falls flat, you've got 25 more serious things to say, you move on. But when you're doing stand-up comedy and the joke falls flat, you're toast. You know, you really are in trouble. So the biggest thing was walking before that live audience. I mean, what you saw, those of you who saw it, um, is a 10-minute edited clip of what was about a 22, 23-minute live stand-up act at a, at a comedy club in Noida. And... Uh, and I'd never done this before. I had no intention of doing it again, but I was determined to try anything once, you know. So when they said, will you do this? I said, fine. And when I walked on there with a few sort of crib notes crib, you know, squished into my hand, uh, no idea, not even a regular frequenter of comedy clubs, no real idea how this was going to work. You bet I was nervous. But the moment the audience lapped it up and they started laughing, even at the not that funny jokes, I realized I, you know, I was okay, and then, then it just went very smoothly. And, and, you and were, when it finished, I didn't want it to end. <laughs> you, you were paired with Kunal Kamra. Well, that, that turned out to be a piece of brilliant timing. Did you ask Kunal Kamra for tips? <laughs> I mean, you, we did talk about, we did talk about uh, the thing, and, and um, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, I asked whether I should try a few UN jokes, and I think they all said, no, <laughs> this is not, not a place for UN jokes. Um, um, and some of the political jokes, actually, um, which were quite funny at that time, uh, couldn't be broadcast in September when Mr. Modi had won so comprehensively in May, because the recording took place between the voting in Kerala and the counting in May. So there was a, a gap of two or three weeks, and that was when I did the recording. Will you and tell so us a joke that did not make it? Um, gosh, uh, you know, you know, you, I wish if you'd given me time, I would have thought, thought, thought I'm having a a brief moment of paralysis, what did I say? Something, there were some jokes about Mr. Modi and the election, of course, which uh, I think at this point, I genuinely can't remember. Uh, if, if you do... <laughs> seriously, I, I'm not being diplomatic, you know me. The most undiplomatic UN official you'll ever encounter. If you do remember before we are done for the evening, we'll come back to this, but Okay, now I'll be scratching my head thinking of questions. old jokes until there's you guys a, finish. There's questions all over. Let's start from the back and we'll... we'll Okay, we can start from where the mic has already reached. Yeah, so for so many of algebras, I think today is the algebra, the art and the ideas, the art and the ideas together. And both of you talked about democracy, constitution. So for you as a politician today, where, where you see our constitution of India down the line five years? Because that's the biggest question mark right now. I think. It's a very good question, a very serious one. And I might add, since I realize now that T.M. Krishna is in the audience, um, that really I, I pay great tribute to you for having had the courage to stand up and speak for your values, which in many ways go well beyond 
why people have come to hear you or listen to you as a singer, as, 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 as who you are. And I think it's wonderful. I think it's, it's so important that our public-spirited uh, citizens who have earned respect and distinction in their own fields uh, have also chosen to speak up. I respect very much the artists, the actors, the... Um, for a politician, it's after all part of our job. We take the lumps that come with it. I've got four cases filed against me, and I, I'm sure there'll be more before I'm done, or before they're done with me. But when it comes to someone like him, he doesn't need the grief. And we know too many very well-known celebrities in this country who have chosen the path of silence, uh, 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 whether they're sportsmen, whether they're actors. Uh, and, you know, who's to say uh, whether the time will come when one day they'll be unable to answer their son or, or, or grandson as to what were you doing when this was done to our country, Daddy. But that's another matter. T.M. Krishna will not have a problem answering that. Um, on the Constitution, I think this is a very important question for one fundamental reason. You see, I've been making speeches about India for the last 30 years, and one of the lines I've said too often, and probably can't say very much longer the way things are going, is that, look, in a big, rich, diverse democracy like India, you don't really need to agree all the time so long as you agree on the ground rules of how you will disagree. That's been our big strength. And, and we, we, we are able to cope with our differences because we accept the same ground rules. For the first time now, after 70 odd years, we have a government that actually has jettisoned the ground rules, that no longer wants to play by the rules that the system has run on for seven decades. And at every level, from trivial matters uh, involving things like... Um, uh, the way in which they chose to bypass my committee on the private data protection bill by inventing a different committee with a BGP chair just to bypass me, and they would do that. Uh, or the way in which they don't invite uh, opposition leaders to state banquets anymore, which the Congress and all previous governments have routinely done. All, all of these petty things, on the one hand, to the more serious matters of the way in which bills are introduced to Parliament at less than the statutory 48 hours notice, often less than 24 hours, uh, and just ra railroaded through despite uh, sensible suggestions from the other side, etc., etc. All of which are one thing. And then the, 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 the diluting of our independent institutions, all of which have come under pressure in various ways. The Fourth Estate, the Election Commission, the Judiciary, um, the Reserve Bank of India, you name everything that used to be respected for its autonomy and its independence, it is no longer as autonomous and independent as it used to be. So we we're looking at a very troubling time, but there is an ideological issue at the heart of it. The Hindutva movement has always rejected the Constitution of India. And when I say always, uh, if you, anyone is interested, I've given you chapter and verse in my book, Why I'm a Hindu, the writings of V.D. Savarkar, originator of the doctrine of Hindutva, of M.S. Golwalkar, the longest serving Sarsang Chalak of the RSS. He headed the RSS from 1940 to 1973, 33 years. And Deen Dayal Upadhyay of Narendra Modi hails as his ideological mentor and guru, who was the head of the Jansang. All three of them are consistent in rejecting the constitution for two reasons. And they've been, they, all three of them say the same things in different words. And I've quoted their exact words in my book. The first thing they say is, we reject it because it is a, an imported document full of foreign values written by Anglophile lawyers in the wrong language. Now, that actually happens to be true. But the fact is, so what? If the ideas are good, if these values have been arrived at in other societies through years of struggle, why shouldn't they be borrowed by us as well? But their second objection is much more fundamental. And that is, they say the following. And I'm not really paraphrasing. These are words they've all used. They say the problem with the Constitution of India is it is based on a very flawed notion, and that is the notion of territorial nationalism. They say the flawed premise of the Constitution is, it says that the nation of India is a territory called India, and the Constitution is written for all the people on this territory. Wrong, they say. A nation is not a territory. A nation is a people. And the people of India are the Hindu people. And everybody else here is either a guest or an interloper. In fact, Goldwalker used the word dacoit, a bandit. And the Goldwalker was actually in some ways the crudest of all three of them, so he spelt it out very clearly. He said the Parsis and the Jews are guests, the Muslims and the Christians are bandits. And they should be treated as, as burglars who've broken into your house. 
That is essentially the attitude. So they all came to the same conclusion. I mean, each of them has different nuances, and I spell those out in my book. I mean, Upadhyay, unlike Golwalkar, does not want to throw, uh, you know, 180 million, 180 million Muslims into the sea. He realizes it's not a practical proposition, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But what uh, they all say is, listen, uh, we need to rewrite the constitution so it reflects truly the soul of India, which is a Hindu concept. We need to create a Hindu Rashtra. And so when you find these relentless assaults on the constitution, it's not superficial. It comes from a very profound ideological conviction in which everybody has been through a serious training in RSS shakas, has heard these arguments since their childhood. Narendra Modi is a Baal Swayam Sevak from the age of eight. So there is some very serious considerations here that those of us who feel a commitment to our constitution should bear in mind. This is not some light, light-hearted uh, uh, or superficial or instinctive process. This is deeply thought out and goes to the heart of an ideological project to change the nature of India from a diverse, pluralist, multi-ethnic, multilingual democracy into the land, Hindu Rashtra, Hindi, Hindutva, Hindustan. That's, that's what the constitution is eventually supposed to become like. And obviously we'll have to fight this every inch of the way, but as long as they have the majorities they have, they're going to push for that. There are a lot of questions. Um, if we could, yep. Hi, sir. My name is Mohit Chavla. Could somebody and get me some water? Yeah. And I met you when, before this program started, and I told you that I've been following you from the age of 15 or 16. Thank you. Yes, that's very kind of you. And then it becomes very important for me to know what you feel about a certain things I want to ask you. First thing is, what do you think, we have been witnessing one thing from last five or six years in the Modi era, that the media is being manhandled very badly. They've just become the mouthpiece of the government. So, and the election commission has become a pretty much biased as we can all see. What do you think is how disastrous or bad could it be for this country? Well, the, the institutions that are appointed by the government, like the election commission and so on, are actually easier to suborn. A lot depends on two things, the character of the individuals who make it up and, the, and their independence and their resolute faith in their own principles and the character of the government that uh, then has to deal with their actions and how to respond to it. So you can have an election commissioner like Mr. Session who took his job very seriously and expanded its powers by simply exercising the rights that he had in theory and that his predecessors had not dared to use quite as much. And the government of the day, in turn, had the decency to accept that the, the, the law gave him the right to exercise those powers, and they fell in line. And that then became the norm until now we have uh, a different set of commissioners who seem to be more willing to accommodate, to put it politely, to the interests of the ruling party, and a government that seems to demand it of them, unlike the previous governments. So that's, again, uh, a reflection. But when you come to the media, it becomes a different issue, because... The government doesn't appoint the media, uh, other than Doordarshan, which frankly uh, uh, is not the problem, oddly enough. It's, it's, it's too bureaucratic to be guilty of all the sins of the private sector media. The private sector media, on the other hand, is actually giving you um, some of the worst excesses that have cheapened our public discourse and, and, and in many ways dragged our politics down into the gutter. And they've done it in the pursuance of their own interests, which are dictated how? I mean, the government can cajole you, the government can cudgel you, and this government prefers the latter. So uh, owners, for example, almost every media outlet here, whether it's television, whether it's a print newspapers and so on, are owned by people who have other business interests. So if an editor takes his editorial independence too seriously, all it takes is a, an income tax raid on one of the other businesses for the owner to fall in line. And the editor then finds is either his job is, is in peril or he's actually out of a job. There have been two or three celebrated cases of editors being dismissed and the others have quickly fallen in line. So these are some of the challenges. Why is it that a mainstream publication can run a, a damaging story on the son of a prominent minister in this government that then disappears even from the website of that mainstream channel within 24 hours? I mean, you know, this is, is this freedom of the press uh, in our democracy? So these are questions that really, I'm afraid, uh, 
need to be answered. I mean, uh, Mr. Advani very famously said after the emergency about the media, you know, when you were asked to bend, you chose to crawl. And uh, it's happening all over again. I think oh, we have pretty much time only for one final question. Yes, the hand there. And, and we'll close after that. Yes. I don't um, mind taking them both unless you're going to be kicked out of the room because people have been waiting for a while. We'll, okay. Uh, since, could we have both questions together? And, and we there's can one more in the them. front here. Three. Can, I'll we, try and we'll, keep my answer okay, shorter. We'll, we'll yeah. answer them together. Hi. Kaushik Rajani here. Uh, you mentioned about a friend in Chicago in 1976 who couldn't get his passport renewed because he was against the emergency. And then after that, we have seen over the period of years all the governments using central agencies against the opposition. But in the last six years, we have seen a blatant use of you know, central agencies against the opposition. And the present government doesn't care what people think about it. And when I speak to people, they simply ask, there is no opposition. So Congress being the national party after BJP, what do you see in the future? Does Congress come as aggressive as BJP or maybe somewhat aggressive and you know, put a challenge to Narendra Modi in 2024? Sure. So I'm sorry, uh, your question stands. Yeah, uh, I think question is, we'll, will Congress sure. be able to, you know, is, is something happening? Sure, no, I've got the yeah, question. Yeah. Could we yeah. just have the other two questions together and then we'll... we'll... Okay, so my question is kind of an extension of his. Great. So you being somewhat of a neutral person, whether not right wing or left wing, why are you still, you know, in alliance with Congress? Is what I want to know. A little what? closer to, to your mouth. I'm I said, why are you still in alliance with Congress? Is what I want to know. You're not left wing or right wing. You're, you're pro India. Is as simple as simple can get. But um, what, what's 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 the reason yeah. of the alliance? And, sorry, one. I think there's, yeah. Let's. See if we can get all the questions quickly. And after Hi, good we'll evening. Start. So it's more on a lighter note. I think I loved your, uh, you know, uh, stand-up comedy, and you completely slayed it with Panash. Uh, so uh, you know, Dr. Tharoor, I think uh, you know you're such a perceptor of linguistic uh, ability. So I'd like to know, on behalf of everybody, what is your favorite word out of the lexicon? Favorite word after? Word. word out of the lexicon. Do you have a favorite word? And, and, <laughs> and, and we'll, there was one last question that we'll take here and then we can answer these together. Dr. Thoreau, I loved your uh, Oxford Union. Uh, it was such a statement, but let me get on with the question. You have brought so much in your experience, what you lived through, how do you deal with not being able to fulfill what you feel you should be doing? How do you feel when you cannot necessarily fulfill, fulfill what you would like to what fulfill? What you what should you like be doing. Okay. You brought... <coughs> anyway. And, and we literally did intend to stop, but I'm being told that there were no questions on this side of the room. Absolute last one. And then we'll, we'll just... Vipul, there. And then I'm sorry, but we will end with that. These are five questions at one go. Hi, so when we're talking about the constitution, it's essentially, I, it's akin to talking about, let's say, macroeconomics, if I think about it. If one was to think about your own personal aspirations, your own drive to achieve, let's say, the top job in the country, uh, so would you like to comment something about that? Because I think that is what the voters these days are come to expect out of politicians. So would you like to say anything about that, sir? Um, <laughs> all right, well, uh, taking them in order, on the question of the Congress, uh, absolutely, I think that the country needs the Congress Party. Uh, to begin with, there are now only two national political formations. Uh, the ones that claim to be national are de facto not. The NCP is a Maharashtra party, the TMC is a Bengal party, the CPM is a Kerala party. There are no other national parties. It's a choice whether you want a government in Delhi for the nation run by the BJP or by the Congress. That's essentially the choice the voters have. Uh, of course, in both cases, they can be part of a larger coalition. 
Vajpayee had a coalition of 26 parties. Manmohan Singh led a coalition of 23 parties. So coalitions are possible, but you're still making a central choice. And these two parties will be the linchpins around which any, any coalition will be formed for the foreseeable future. And therefore, the Congress is indispensable if the nation wants a choice. I mean, we can't constantly say we can't stand this government, but we'll vote for them because there's nobody else. Of course, there is somebody else. The question is whether the somebody else has been able to convince you we do a better job. And I think there, we, we may have been guilty of some deficiencies of organization, of, of marketing, to use an unfashionable word today, of putting across our message effectively, of using all the tools that are available in the 21st century to disseminate our message. Um, I mean, I was told just a little earlier today that the BJP has 50,000 WhatsApp groups in West Bengal alone, just for the West Bengal elections. 50,000. Each of those groups has 256 members. And there are people uh, paid by the BJP to run, you know, a, a few of these groups each. And so that probably, God knows, for 50,000 groups, they must have maybe um, 5,000 uh, people running 10 groups each or whatever. And these fellows, they do nothing all day long but feed BJP and pro-Hindutva messaging to the people on those groups. And presumably those groups will grow. Now, if this is true, and I, I can't verify, I didn't get it from a BJP source, uh, but the truth is that that's the sort of challenge that any modern political party has to contend with in India today. We are certainly not in that league yet. Uh, but we need to be. Because I genuinely believe that the message we have is a vastly superior message to that of hatred, division, and prejudice, which is what the Hindutva agenda is built on. And that the message of inclusion, of diversity, of acceptance of difference, of mutual respect, is something that most of us practice in our daily lives. And there is no logical reason why we shouldn't practice it in our political existence in this country, if only we believe that that message had a credible messenger. And that's where we are at fault, that we have not been sufficiently effective in persuading large sections of the public that they can trust us to fulfill the conditions of this message. And that is something the Congress Party has to resolve. I've been more outspoken than is good for me, but I have been saying within the party we should. So that partially answers the second question as well, because obviously, uh, for me, there is no question of a choice between the BJP and the Congress. There is no choice. Uh, the BJP stands for a number of elements that I profoundly disagree with and uh, I'm troubled with uh, in our country's history and politics. Uh, and, and the Congress, for the reasons I mentioned much earlier in answering one of Pyle's questions, I, I did mention that uh, there was a lot about the Congress that I could agree with today, even if I was a critic of theirs in the 70s. Sorry? Forming my own party would frankly not have... I mean, be, I'll be very honest, I'm a realistic man. Uh, and and I, I know that I have something of a popular following around the country, at least judging by the number of selfies I'm obliged to give. And I'm not saying that as a complaint. Uh, it's just, just wherever I go, even in obscure parts of UP and MP, I've been accosted, and that surprises me. But I'm gratified and I'm touched. But I know it all adds up to the ability to lose my deposit in every constituency in the country. Because I, you know, my, my, what the, there's an American expression, his support is an inch deep and a mile wide. So I have a little bit of support everywhere. I don't have, in a parliamentary system, that's no use. If it was a presidential system, I'd perhaps want to be a viable contender. But in a parliamentary system, what you need is the ability to win 50% or as close to 50 as possible in one place or in a multiple number of one places that can give you seats in parliament to make a difference politically. So having a party like that uh, would be, frankly, Impossible, as Mr. Kejriwal found to his cost. You may remember the original Aam Aadmi Party had branches everywhere, Mumbai, Bangalore, Haryana, Punjab, they ran everywhere. And now they've basically become a Delhi party because they realize that they, they, their ambitions, their organizational strength, their financing, and the, uh, the level of support will only get them this one place. So you have to understand that it's not easy for people to just start thinking of an, a nationwide party in this country. But I can also counter that by saying, but why do that when there is a perfectly good party available? The Congress party actually is a party that can be an enormous force for good in this country and has learned a lot from its experience. If I may paraphrase those questions, I think uh, 
the brutal way of asking it is, has Rahul Gandhi let the country down as much as Narendra Modi? Narendra Modi's are sins of commission. You can point to disastrous things he has done, starting with the disaster of demonetization, which cost 2.6% of our GDP, to the botched implementation of GST. I mean, if demonetization was a, a bad idea implemented badly, GST was a good idea implemented badly. You've seen one thing after another. You've seen some of the inflammatory rhetoric that's come out of him and his home minister. You can actually point to very specific sins of commission. For Rahul Gandhi, what sin of commission can you accuse him of? Um, you can accuse him of some sins of omission. But I think, still think that he ran a very effective campaign last time. He just didn't wash against Mr. Modi, but he, he was full-time. No, he, come on. He, he we, was full-time there, and he fought Maybe hard, he, and he was, yeah. he was visible. Look, at the bottom, the, the issue is not that. You've already made your decision. The voters have voted. We know what you've done. And he has been gracious enough to say, okay, my head on the chopping block. So the, the, it's, it's silly to point fingers at a man who has immediately said, I'm guilty, the buck stops with me, I'm falling down. I think you uh, have to look at the person who's in power I'm, and is I'm, doing real I'm, damage I'm to the country. I'm going to interrupt day day. only to push the question not, I agree with you. I think the question is, if he is not the answer, we feel we need an answer. I think this question is one of anguish, not of accusation. Okay, How do so we find have, an answer? I have come up with an answer. An answer is that I believe the Congress Party should hold an internal election. Let anybody put their names forward. Let's see who, who attracts the support of the party workers. And I, I um, thank you, but I've been greeted with a resounding silence in my own party, so I'm not sure, I'm not sure that's going to go very far. But, but you know, I, I do believe that all democratic parties faced with such dilemmas in other countries have that solution available to them. They have an internal election, and that's it. And in fact, the election has a further advantage, not just of finding a leader, but of actually energizing the voters who feel empowered that they can get to decide who their leader is going to be, and also galvanizing the interest of the voters. Look what happened to the Conservative Party. Does anyone remember last May the Conservative Party was riding second or even in some places third in the polls after Theresa May had had such a disastrous time and she resigned? And then they had this election with 16 candidates. And each round they eliminated one or two people and so finally it came down to two and then Boris Johnson emerged. By the end of that process, the voters have been so captivated by all of this that Johnson was suddenly the favorite uh, and he was indeed bold enough then to call an election and win it. So it happened because in many ways, voters were drawn by the internal election process to paying attention. I think this would be a perfect mechanism to reviving the Congress party. But I agree there is absolutely no sympathy for it out there. So just uh, that, yes. My favorite word, very simply, read. Read, read, read. It, it's, if you read, you will find uh, all the other words will come with it. Uh, sir, I've forgotten your question. His question was, how do you, how do you feel? Sorry. I'm sorry. I've been... <laughs> it was no, he said, you've already answered it, which is... Uh, he said you, he's withdrawn his question because you answered it. I think he felt, how do you feel about not always being able to accomplish everything you wish to? Yeah, no, I, I, I don't give up. You know, I'll be very honest, as a father, I've said to my kids from when they were knee high to a grasshopper, I've said, never give up. I mean, that's the, the one, one philosophy, you know. I mean, actually, two philosophies. The other one I always tell them is never let yourself down. No one can blame you for not being able to do what you were not able to do. But for not being able to do what you are able to do, that's unforgivable. So the two philosophies I teach my own children as a father is what I'll teach the nation as well in my own life and conduct. I will never give up, and I will never, never do less than I'm capable of doing. So she said very graciously about my hard work. I'm touched about that. In fact, recently... My former assistant, Manu Pillay, who's become a very successful popular historian. Manu is at uh, Algebra frequently. Okay, and he's given an interview when he was asked about what he learned from me, and he said about the virtue of hard work. He's talked about sort of watching me. He said, uh, away, and I at feel two, very good about that. He said at 2 a.m. he would open his window to see your light was still on, and he thought, how can I go to sleep? Well, he's got three best-selling books as a result of not seeing you sleep. There you are. So, I mean, <laughs> I'm, I'm pleased about that, and it makes me happy because, frankly, I grew up at a time when you, know, the, 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 you were brought up not to show the effort, right? So whatever you did, however hard you worked, you were not supposed to show it. You know, it, everything was meant to look effortless. This whole business of grace under pressure was very much a thing in those days. And, and uh, tell us whether you've remembered the Mr. Modi joke. <laughs> 
Oh, Mr. Modi Joe. I think one was, I had this little riff about millennial lingo. And uh, one of the words that um, the millennials use is ghosting. <laughs> so I said, uh, oh, I understand now. Mr. Modi has ghosted an entire nation. <laughs> they cut that out because obviously ghosting is, sorry, I should have explained that. I did in the, in the joke. Ghosting is supposed to mean saying, uh, making a lot of promises and then disappearing. That's ghosting, right? So somebody tells you, let's have coffee tomorrow. And then when you're saying, what time should we meet for coffee? The guy's not there anymore. And I'm sure there are some young people in this room who have had that experience. You've been ghosted. Then, or maybe you've done it to others. You've ghosted somebody else. So I said, then, making a lot of promises and then disappearing, Mr. Modi has ghosted an entire nation. That was, that was one joke that I've... Okay. I didn't actually make it to the final. Um, thank you, Dr. Tharoor, for that very wide-ranging, but also a look into the making of your own life that I think is, is a unique insight into where your politics, where your person comes from. Thank you so much for your candor. Please join us for drinks. I know the club has laid out a fabulous buffet dinner. Uh, I hope both our uh, speakers will be around to sign books and continue the conversations informally. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so evening. much. Thanks a great question.